Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Well, can I, I'm, I'm going to ignore that. Um, can I just start by wishing everyone uh, a very happy and peaceful new year? Um, I, wonder, I wonder what opportunities and challenges the year ahead has in store for, for us, for each one of us as individuals and as a church. There may be exciting new ventures, new opportunities for outreach, and discipleship, new encounters and new relationships to nurture and enjoy in the months to come. Some of us may have made New Year resolutions. The turn of the year is always a good time to review our situation and our lifestyle and maybe make some changes, some, some new commitments to make a fresh start. But if we wish to succeed... I hope we'll draw on more than, our own, than just our own human willpower. We need God's strength if we're truly to prevail and make changes for the better. So there are, there are all kinds of opportunities ahead of us. But of course, there will also be challenges. At uh, a government level, um, we face anti-Christian legislation um, in the media, we often hear anti-Christian voices reflecting a growing level of hostility to Christian things in our society. In our church life, we will face opposition if we're truly reaching out with the gospel message. And then, of course, in our personal lives, there are all, we've already alluded to the fact there are all kinds of challenges that we may face. <coughs> in addition to the, the daily struggle of discipleship, to resist temptations that make war on our souls and to live in ways that please the Lord. Quite frankly, that's something we're totally unable to do in our own strength. We need to be empowered by Christ if we are to take our stand and live for his glory. The great thing is, is as we've already heard, that we have a mighty king, a strong deliverer, one whose purposes will be fulfilled in our lives. But we, but we do need to, to be empowered by Christ. In a couple of weeks' time, um, many of us will, will um, hopefully take the opportunity to reaffirm our commitment to, to the life and work of this church. And as we do so, um, and as we uh, seek to commit ourselves to live in ways that are pleasing to the Lord, we, we will do so with God's help. Because there's, there, uh, we, there's no way 
that we can even aspire to do these things in our own strengths. Why? Because we're in a spiritual battle. That's what Paul tells us in our passage this morning. Paul is writing to the great city of Ephesus, which is full of false religion, occult practices, and the pressure to conform to the imperial cult. He's begun by setting out the great privileges of life in Christ, but from the middle of chapter 4, he has been urging his readers to stand against the pagan lifestyle around them and reflect the gospel of the reflect the light of the gospel in their own lives and now in the last section of his letter he issues a rousing challenge to stand firm for the christian faith just want to hear it again um, those first few verses finally be strong in the lord and in the strength of his might put on the whole armor of god that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Here, um, at at the climax of Paul's great letter to the Ephesians, He chooses to forewarn us about the reality of the conflict we will inevitably face as Christians. So as we we look at this passage together, I want to look first at the battle that we are in, secondly at drawing on God's strength, and thirdly standing firm in the armour that God supplies. So let's make a start. Firstly, the battle we're in. On September the 11th, 2001, 20 years ago, Americans woke up to the fact that they had an enemy. I remember the day well. I was at home sorting through old files when I decided to switch on the radio for company. And at first, I seemed to be listening to a very odd radio play where terrorists had flown, plane in, had flown planes into the World Trade Center. And then suddenly, I became aware that it was all real. I rushed downstairs and watched the TV, transfixed by the unbelievable sight of the Twin Towers collapsing to the ground before my very eyes. The world as we knew it had been turned upside down, like some scene from an overdramatic disaster movie. And I guess... None of us will ever forget the images which were seared into our minds on that terrible day, especially as they've been shown again and again. The human drama, the the tragedy of that day, is something that caught us all up in its wake in one way or another. And Americans woke up to the fact that they were hated, that they had an enemy who was out to attack them in any way it could, that their whole way of life was under attack. And um, in the last two years, we've seen the same kind of thing in Ukraine and Israel. Um, But as Christians, we too have an enemy. We too are in a battle. We too are caught up in a fierce conflict which is inescapable. Some of us were, were given the impression that when we came to Christ, all would be peace and joy. And I have to say that is so wrong. Yes, the peace and joy are, are very real, but so is the conflict. Uh, a few years ago, a friend forwarded me an email from another Christian asking that we stop using songs with martial or military lyrics in our worship. They felt that many of our worship songs were too jingoistic and might be seen as glorifying war. Well, I sympathise with those who are fully aware of the horrors of war with all its hellish consequences. But for Christians, the imagery of warfare is inescapable because we are in a battle. We have a real enemy of our souls 
who's implacably opposed to our welfare and who will stop at nothing to destroy our spiritual lives. We have a real enemy, but a far greater saviour. That's worth holding on to. But the Bible is, is full of warnings about the spiritual dangers we face. Thankfully, we also have a mighty saviour who's already won the decisive victory. But just like the um, Nazi army after D-Day, the enemy still refuses to concede defeat. Let us make no mistake. The devil is very real. I was talking to a fellow minister, a uh, church minister of a more liberal persuasion recently, and they, they told me that in their last sermon, they were questioning whether we could really still believe in a personal devil in the 21st century. Well, the answer is surely an unequivocal yes. As, as a gospel minister, I've certainly seen evidence of the devil's opposition, just as I can also bear testimony to God's empowering strength. There are times when you just have to laugh at Satan's attempts to disrupt gospel ministry because they're so obvious and they just drive you back to greater dependence on God. But of course, the devil's existence is no laughing matter. In the introduction to his brilliant book, The Screwtape Letters, C.S. Lewis said, there are two equal... There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. We see the, the, the first attitude all around us when people wear red devil horns to parties or dress their children as little devils. To them, the whole idea of the devil is a joke. They have no idea that he is real and delights in the destruction of their souls. On the other hand, we don't want to fall into the opposite error and magnify the devil by talking too much, by talking too much about him. I like the title of Michael Green's book about the devil, I Believe in the Devil in Satan's Downfall. The fact is we don't live in a dualistic system. The, the devil is not equal in power to our God. Indeed, Satan is a defeated enemy. But he still thrashes around and we need to be careful. We're not to live in fear of him because Christ has triumphed over the powers of evil. We need not live in fear, but the full fruits of victory are yet to be seen. So we need to be aware of the conflict and equipped with power to stand against God's enemies and ours. And we need to be aware of Satan's evil cunning. Paul speaks here of the devil's schemes, and again in 2 Corinthians 2.11 he says, we are not ignorant of his designs. The devil can be subtle as a serpent when he attacks. Dr. Lloyd-Jones said, I am certain that one of the main causes of the ill state of the church today is the fact that the devil is being forgotten. We are ignorant of this great objective fact, the being, the existence of the devil, the adversary, the accuser, and his fiery darts. We'll hear more about those fiery darts later in the series when we consider the shield of faith. But what are they? As, as believers... We have enemies to fight outside and within. So, for instance, we have a daily battle with our sinful nature. It may be lustful thoughts, greed, uncontrolled anger, falsehood, boasting, so, uh, sinful pride, unwholesome talk, and so on. All the things that belong to our old life that have no rightful place in our Christian walk. And don't forget the devil often uses 
trickery and subterfuge. He can make things look so attractive and desirable, and yet in reality, they are a vicious trap. So we need to be on our guard. Maybe times when your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, as 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says. But at other times, he disguises himself as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Often it may be easier to stand up against persecution from outside than against subtle temptation within. Remember how the serpent carefully seduced Eve seemed so full of friendliness and concern, but actually making her doubt God's word and character, leading the human race into ruin. (coughs) How we need God's word to expose the reality (coughs) of Satan's character. Our best protection is regular time in the word of God, enfolded in prayer. Of course, the battle is not just with us as individuals, but as churches and groups of God's people. The devil loves to sow seeds of confusion in our ranks. Whenever we get caught up in mutual recrimination and hostility, we can be sure that the devil is having a field day and we've forgotten who the real enemy is. So let's be careful not to allow the enemy to use us to undermine the faith of other Christians or make us a stumbling block to non-believers around us. So firstly, that's the battle that we're in. Secondly, we're called to be strong in the Lord. How can we possibly stand up against an enemy like this? Humanly speaking, it's impossible. But the power of God can defend us. Our enemies may be strong, but God is stronger. As 1 John 4 verse 4 says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That's worth holding on to. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. God's power raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to the highest place. And it's that same power which gives us a new life and a heavenly standing if we have trusted in him. Before our conversion, we had little or no experience of the devil. He didn't openly attack us. He didn't need to. But if we're Christians, then the devil is against us. We may not experience it all the time, but just try to study your Bible or spend time in serious prayer and you'll find considerable distractions coming your way. Or seek to share your faith with an unbeliever and you'll soon know that you have an enemy. The devil is against us and that's frightening. But remember that God is with us. James 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. As um, a Doctor Who fan, it's been great watching some of the old Doctor Who programs on iPlayer recently. And some of the Doctor's most terrifying opponents were the Daleks and the Cybermen. And both creatures would advance proclaiming, Resistance is useless, causing humans to quail before them and small children to hide behind sofas. I know because I was one of those small children. Um, But similarly, the, the devil also tries to tell us that resistance is useless. He pretends that he has more power than he really possesses. He tells us, you can't help yourself. It's the way you were made. There's no point trying to resist. You know you'll lose in the end, so you might as well give in now. But Paul wants us to withstand the devil's attacks, trusting not in our own strength, but in the Lord and his mighty power. 
God's power is already shown at the cross that it is too much for the powers of darkness. And that strength is ours in Christ. We can put our full trust in it. As Christians, none of us is alone in the battle. It's the Lord's battle we're in, and it's he who gives us strength and supplies all we need to stand firm in our faith. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Literally, we're called to be strengthened. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Divine resources are available to us through his spirit, the same power that was available in his mighty resurrection. (coughs) And Paul gives this charge to all his listeners. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. In the Greek, this is in the plural. It's not just for individuals. God calls all his people to common action. We're not only to seek his power ourselves, but to encourage one another to stand firm in God's power as we seek to resist the devil together. So at the start of a new year, let's be ready to seek God's strength to ask him to to fill us with his spirit, with that mighty power, to live for him in the year ahead. Let's be ready to, to pray for ourselves and for one another, that God will fill us with his spirit and empower us to live for him. In a moment, I'm going to ask us to do that, to, to pray for ourselves and one another at the start of a new year. But before that, let me just touch on my third point. We need to stand firm in the armour God supplies. (coughs) It may be that all of this military language is not to your taste. I understand that. But, you know, serving in the Lord's army is not an optional thing. It's not an option reserved for the super keen or the spiritual elite. If we've put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then each one of us is a Christian soldier, whether we like it or not. The only question is whether we're, pre- we're a prepared soldier or an unprepared one. If we're unprepared, we cannot hope to stand in the battle. The world, the flesh, and the devil will overwhelm us if we're trusting in our own strength and resources. But God has equipped us with everything we need. And Paul doesn't give us a choice about whether or not we should wear the spiritual armour. He knows that we need it, so he tells us to put it on, all of it. The, The belt of truth, signifying our confidence in the word of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the righteous standing which God imputes to us, and indeed the righteousness he imparts to us, as we're not only justified but also sanctified. The gospel shoes of a ready witness, going forward in faith. The shield of faith which protects us from all those fiery darts. The helmet of salvation, the assurance of of our salvation, that we belong to God. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And added to all this is the weapon of all prayer, as the Puritans used to call it. Or if you prefer, each piece put on with prayer, as one of our hymns puts it. We'll be looking more closely at each piece of armour over the next few weeks, But for now, I just want to make the point that the armour God gives us for our protection is the same armour that he himself wore in the decisive battle which he fought for us. One writer, Ian Duguid, says, When we stand and fight against Satan, we can do so only in the strength of the victory that Christ has already won. 
when we stand and fight against Satan, we can do so only in the strength of the victory that Christ has already won. So the belt of truth is the belt of faithfulness that girds the messianic king in Isaiah 11, verse 5. The, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation come from the divine warrior's armour in Isaiah 59, verse 17. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. The feet shod with gospel readiness are the feet of those who proclaim the arrival of Christ's kingdom in Isaiah 52, verse 7. And he himself is the shield of faith, as he told Abraham in Genesis 15, verse 1, I am your shield. And the sword of the Spirit, the word of God, is the weapon wielded by the promised servant of the Lord in Isaiah 49, verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. Jesus wore this same armour that we are provided with all the way to the cross, standing firm against the devil's schemes to the end. All the attacks, all the temptations that we face, he also faced and overcame. And because of his great victory for us at the cross, his power is now at work in us, helping us to live for him. We're not alone in the fight. I don't know if you've been watching Mr. Bates versus the post office this week. It's a, a TV program telling the appalling story of how the post office relentlessly prosecuted sub-postmasters for shortfalls which were actually caused by failures in its own computer system. Many of the workers were told that they were the only ones who had the problems with the system, which, which drove them to despair. But the turning point came when they discovered that they were not on their own. There were at least 500 sub-postmasters who had experienced the same problems. And from that moment on, they knew they were not alone. And the fight back began. Well, as Christians, none of us is on our own in the battle. Not only um, do we have brothers and sisters all over the world uh, sharing in the same struggles, but more importantly, we have Jesus Christ. He is with us. And his victory at the cross means that our struggle is never hopeless. God has equipped us to, to stand firm in our faith. Whatever challenges the devil throws at us, we can stand our ground by clinging to Christ and drawing on his strength. Satan has no power to snatch away those who truly trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Father will never let them go. If you are trusting in him, he will never <coughs> Let you go. Jesus Christ has already won the decisive victory. And he will aid us in the fight. May God be praised. Amen.